our uh, friendship uh, with Brother and Mrs. O'Gorman goes back many, many years. In uh, 1988, uh, Brother and Mrs. O'Gorman moved to the United States to attend uh, Bible College in Wisconsin. And at that same time, we were introduced to them here at North Love Baptist Church, where they became members and served the Lord with us then during that uh, tenure here in the United States. And then went back to their home. Uh, Brother uh, Dave had been a very successful businessman and uh, went back and became the pastor of the LifeGate Baptist Church, an incredible church there outside of Dublin. They had, the ministry uh, has now expanded to many other locations in the in Ireland, as he and then his son and their families of uh, just a great passion for winning their countrymen to Christ. And uh, they also have uh, a vibrant RU ministry as well as a men's discipleship home. And so God's gifted them with a multitude of ministries. They're here in the United States up with our good friend, Pastor Wayne Van Gelderen's uh, Bible conference or, uh, that he has each year at this time of year. And uh, so when I heard that uh, they were going to be here, I invited him down for dinner and for an opportunity for us to have some spiritual dinner. And so Brother Dave O'Gorman is going to come and speak to us at this time. Well, join me and give him a good welcome, would you please? Thank you, Dave. Thank you. It is good to be here with you tonight. Always a pleasure to be with your pastor and his family. They've been such a blessing to us over the years, and this church has been a blessing to us. Uh, I was counting it up uh, just there, and it is... Now I've forgotten. <laughs> yeah, it, it is 27 years that we've been coming down here. 27 years our connection with, with Northland Baptist Church, and you have been a great blessing to us over the years. And you know what? Uh, it's interesting, but life doesn't afford you many friends that, are that, that go that, back that far. And I do I praise the Lord for you and for your family and for this church. All right, uh, I want to talk to you tonight about the mercy of God. And um, just a word of personal testimony, I live in the mercy of God. Uh, recently, my wife and I, last Sunday actually, we, we celebrated a, uh, an anniversary. <clears throat> and I won't tell you how long, it, it, the, 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 it was the day that we met. I won't tell you how long ago we met because you'd accuse, accuse me of snatching her from the cradle. Uh, you'd say she couldn't be that old and she'd kill me. So I'm not going to tell you how long it is, all right? But I was looking back over my life and, you know, <clears throat> as I look back over my life, and there's kind of several lifetimes. We got saved when we were um, <clears throat> in our mid-20s. Te- mid and then we came to Bible college, and then we uh, <clears throat> went home and uh, began pastoring in the church, and several lifetimes involved. And the, the one thing that I see all the way through it is the mercy of God. Amen. You know, I've got a wonderful family. They love the Lord. They're serving the Lord. Each one, You know what? I made enough state, mistakes to send them all into the world. But the mercy of God came through. We've got a wonderful church. Church has blessed and grown over the years. And you know what? I'm not that great a pastor, but the mercy of God is wonderful. And you know, as I look at it, there's not many things in this world you can bank on. But you can bank on the mercy of God. Amen. You can depend upon it. You can be sure of it. Let's look tonight at the mercy. But what we'll do is we'll pray, and then we'll begin to look in Exodus chapter 33. We'll read a couple of verses there, and then Exodus chapter 34. That's a word of prayer for us. Father, would you bless us tonight? Lord, uh, we look to you, Lord, and ask you to put your hand upon us. Lord, we know that you are merciful. Lord, help us to see it. Help our hearts to be thrilled with it. And, oh, Lord, may we love you all the more and depend upon you all the more. And, oh, Lord, may we be careful to place ourselves in the place where you can show all the mercy that you have in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Exodus chapter 33. Now, Exodus chapter 33, you'll know, is where Moses has come to the end of himself. The people have rebelled against God, and God has said, right, that's it, Moses. I'm going to send an angel with you. I'm not going with you because they, they are going to provoke me, and I'm going to destroy them, so I won't go anymore. And Moses has learned some things along the road. The people haven't learned much, but Moses has learned, and he has decided, you know what? I want God with me. And if I haven't got God with me, I don't want to go to the promised land. I don't want it. I mean, he may as well just go and kill us all because I don't want anything if I haven't got God with me. So he pleads with God and God says, okay, Moses, I will go with you and I will give you rest. All right? And then Moses, in this intimate moment with God, gets very daring. 
and he asks God for something for himself, something very personal. And he, he does not in, uh, in verse 18 of chapter 33, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now, if you ask God to show you his glory, what would you expect to see? Maybe he would explode a mountain. Maybe he would catch a few stars and fling them away. You know, uh, maybe he would show his wrath. What would you expect to see? I want you to note the answer God gives him here. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. When, Mo, when, when Moses asked God to show him his glory, God starts talking about his mercy. Isn't that interesting? That's not what I would expect. Look over in, in chapter 34. Uh, chapter 34 and verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Now, you know that six times, not the word mercy, but six times God talks there about his mercy, his forgiveness, his goodness. You know what? God is communicating something to us about himself. He is communicating the fact that he is a merciful God, and he wants us to know him as a merciful God. Yeah. Now, God judges. God does wrath like nobody else can do it. But you know what? When, when you ask God, who are you? He says, I'm merciful. I am a merciful God. I want people to know me as a merciful God. If we were to see God tonight, we would not particularly pick up on mercy. When we see God, we, particular, we, we, we tend to see his holiness, and it tends to uh, shake us to our very core. That's what you see in the Bible. Isaiah sees God in his holiness in Isaiah chapter 6, and, and he is awed by the holiness of God, and he feels like he's so unclean by comparison. Even the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 1, when he sees the Lord in, his, in all his glory, he sees holiness and he falls at his feet as though dead. But when you ask God, who are you? God says, I'm merciful. He wants us to know him as a merciful God. Now, that's interesting. You know, you can talk about your pagan gods and none of them are merciful. They're not merciful gods. You know, they're the kind of gods you have to keep right with because if you don't keep right with them, they'll destroy you. Allah, he's not merciful. You know what? Uh, he, he's strict, severe, hard, and he's downright mean. But our God says, no, I'm a merciful God. I want you to know me as a merciful God. <clears throat> Second thing I want you to see is this, that God is more inclined to mercy than he is to wrath. In Micah 7, verse 18, it says, he delighteth in mercy. God delights in mercy. Now, you will search the Bible back and forth, up and down and sideways. You'll never find where it says that God delights in wrath. You won't find, you won't find where God says that God delights in judgment. Now, don't get me wrong. God's, God does wrath and God does judgment and God is just and God is holy. But he doesn't delight in that. That's not what he wants to do. In a sense, you've got to force him to do that. Lamentations 3, verse 22 and 23, uh, 32 and 33 says, uh, But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion, according to the multitude of his mercies, for he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. God never wants to make it hard for us. That's not, that's not his will. That's not his desire. That's not his plan. That's, that's, that's what he wants to do. Somebody compared it, it's, it's, it's a very <clears throat> simple uh, comparison, uh, to a bee. A bee is an interesting creature. I mean, you're out in the garden and you hear the bees buzzing around. It's, 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 it's nice. Uh, you, and the bees then they go off and they make their honey. But if you cross the bee, you're going to find that that pleasant little creature has a sting. But the purpose of bees is not to find people to sting. They do that as a last resort. They do that when there's no other way out for them. And, you know, their, their, their purpose is to make honey. You know, God wants to be known as a God that wants to show mercy. Don't force him to sting. Don't force him to wrath. He doesn't want you to see him like that. Uh, 
Number three, I want you to see this, that there's no condition we can be in, but that we can see some mercy in it. Wherever you're at tonight, whatever's going on in your life, no matter how grim it looks, no matter how dreadful it looks, there's mercy available. Jeremiah <clears throat> sits in the book of Lamentations on the ruin heap of Jerusalem. Everything is destroyed. The people have been killed. The city has been destroyed. And what makes it worse is he's been warning them this was going to happen, and they haven't, they haven't been listening. And so finally, that which he's been warning of, that's which he's been pleading with them of, uh, to, not to avert, happens. God judges. And he sits on the ruin heap of Jerusalem, and he's just, he's, he's weeping. That's what the book means, the Lamentations, he's weeping. But he says this, he says in, in the middle of it, he says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. He says, you know, it could be worse. We could be consumed. For his compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. And wherever you are tonight, you know what? There's mercy available. You just think about it. There's mercy available and working in the situation. Another thing is mercy sweetens God, all God's other attributes. Can you imagine we have a holy God, we have a just God, we have a, a, a righteous God, we have a God that shows wrath and shows judgment. We have all those things and no mercy. Where would we be today? We'd be in pretty dire straits, wouldn't we? I was thinking this the other day. You know, I think that it's the mercy of God that allows him to love us. Because here's what we do, you and I. Every day, we do something that would grieve the heart of a holy God. Now, it may not be a serious thing as far as men are concerned, but every day we do something. You know, and, and, and we can grieve. Remember, remember the Lord Jesus uh, when, they, when they couldn't heal uh, the, the, the man's child, and, and um, uh, they, they came to him and they said, why can't, why can't we heal him? And he said this to them. He said, oh, 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 faithless and perverse generation, how long must I endure you? I don't think he was very happy with them that day. I, you know, I think, I think he was bothered by them. And, you know, I think the stuff we do may not necessarily be grade A sins, but you know what? I think we can bother God. But you know what happens? Mercy covers over it. He knows what we are. He knows our frame. He knows what we're like. And mercy covers over it, so it allows him to love us. Um, mercy should make us both happy and humble. Happy because it's there. Yeah. There's mercy for me. Oh, that, 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 should, that should make you happy. That should make you happy to think, listen, I'm facing into a new day tomorrow. Uh, all the other days so far may have been bad, and I may have put myself out of the place of mercy, but you know what? Tomorrow there's mercy for me. It ought to make us happy. It ought to also make us humble. Because you know one of the things we're going to see about mercy is you can't earn it. You never get to the place where you can say, now God, I expect mercy. I've earned it. If you could earn mercy, it wouldn't be mercy. You have to be broke, in a sense, to get mercy. You have to come to the place where you can't. And you come looking for him to show you mercy. And mercy is what he shows you. Um, Job 10, verse 15 says this, If I be wicked, woe unto me. And if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head. Why? Did he, would he not lift up his head? Because you know what? If you're righteous tonight, it's the mercy of God working in your life. Did you ever think about that? I'm one of five siblings. I, my sister, my younger sister, got saved shortly after we got saved. And she served in the Lord in Armenia. But I have three other siblings, and they don't know the Lord. And I've talked to them about the Lord. You know? And I, some, I look at myself, and I say, well, how come I'm saved and they're not? How come I know the Lord and... They didn't. You know, the most I ever did was say, yes, I need mercy. That's all I've ever done. Yes, Lord, I need mercy, and God showed mercy in my life. They've never done that, but I'm no better than them. But I'm saved. I'm a child of God. I'm on my way to heaven. I've got mercy flowing through my life, rich and free, and they don't. Now, it's available to them. It's there, but they don't. You know what? Listen, it's mercy. I can't sit, stand here tonight and say, well, you know what? The reason I am where I am today is because I checked all the boxes and I got it right because I didn't. My wife is here, she'll tell you I didn't. I, uh, the reason I'm here is the mercy of God. It's his mercy. The reason you're where you are today is because the mercy of God. I, 
Romans 2, 4 says, uh, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? That the goodness of God steps in and leads you to repentance. Listen, everything we have, we have because of mercy. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 <clears throat> says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men can slackness. And listen to this, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yeah. Do you know the mercy of God is for all those people out there? Now, they may bother you and I. They, they, may, they, 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 they may irritate and annoy us because of their wickedness and their sin and all the rest. But do you know God's holding back the end of the world so they can get saved? He cares. He wants to show mercy. I mean, we look at the wickedness in our world and we say, oh God, if I was you, I'd end it all right now. God says, no, I'm not going to end it. I want them to get saved. He wants to show mercy. He delights in showing mercy. Now, how does God show mercy? Hosea 14 verse 4 speaks of it when it says, I will love them freely. God shows mercy freely. Aren't you glad that he shows it freely? What would you have to do to earn mercy? You can't. He shows it freely. God gives it without anything that we earn. Now, we are a meritorious people. What I mean by that is this. You know, everything we do, we kind of earn. Right? You go out, you work hard, you get the money, and you say, well, I earn my money. You know, uh, you have a relationship on a human level, and very often what we do is we feel like, you know, well, listen, it's a give and take situation, and we've kind of earned it. And then we come to this relationship that we have with God, and there's nothing we can do to add to him. Nothing. You know what? He gives us mercy freely. Yeah. You didn't earn his love, and you can't lose it. It's free. He gives it to you free. Secondly, God's mercy is an overflowing mercy. Uh, Psalm 86 verse 5 speaks of him as being plenteous in mercy. Ephesians 2 verse 4 speaks of him as being rich in mercy. Psalm 51 verse 1 speaks of the multitude of the mercies of God. Listen, you know, God, mercy flows rich and free with God. He, listen, the, the most humbling times in life are those moments when God steps in and you know you don't deserve it. You know that if it was you on the other end of it, you just, you, you just kind of kick you to the curb. And God steps in and he shows you mercy. Have you experienced that? It's there. He shows mercy. Hey, he'll bring a tear to your eyes sometimes. Just because he's so good when you don't deserve it. But he shows us mercy freely and he shows us an overflowing mercy. Now let me give you a warning. Don't abuse the mercy of God. Yeah. You know, it's very easy for us to come to the place where we say, okay, well, you know what? God will be merciful to me. He'll let me away with this. You know, I, 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 it won't cost me much. I'll, I'll, you know, God, God's mercy. I, I can ask him for mercy and God will give me mercy. Don't do that one. Right? Because I guarantee you, whenever you do that, there's going to be a price tag involved for you. Not that God won't show you mercy, but there's a price tag involved with you. Somebody put it this way. They said it's like having a first aid kit. You look at the first aid kit and you say, you know what? I've never used the first aid kit. So you take out the hammer and you whack yourself so you can use your first aid kit. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, you, you don't want to be in the place where you're getting it wrong so you can find mercy. That's ridiculous. Now, don't abuse the mercy of God. You don't, don't, God's going to show you mercy, but don't abuse it. Don't put yourself in that place uh, where, you, uh, where you need his mercy like that, right? And then how do you access this mercy? Now, there's four points here and we're done, but this is, these are kind of the key of where we're going. Four points, I'm going to ask you some questions and, and we're done, right? First of all, recognize your need. You don't deserve it. You know what happens to us? We think we deserve God to treat us right. You'll know the story of the, <clears throat> the publican and the Pharisee, right? You know, the Pharisee, actually turn there with me, Luke chapter 18, and just look at it with me here. Luke 18. Now, <clears throat> and I, I'll tell you what I end up thinking when I'm reading through this passage, and you, you can tell me if that's what, what goes through your mind too. Luke chapter 18 and verse 10. Verse 9 says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, he's giving you the key. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. 
The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exhausted. I exalted. Now, let me tell you what happens when I read this passage. It may not be these words, but here's what happens. I read the passage and I go, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that Pharisee. I thank you that I'm one of the good guys and not one of the bad guys like that. Isn't that what we tend to do? What we do is we put ourselves in the place where, you know, we're the good guys. You know, we deserve something from God. And I want you to notice that the Pharisee got nothing. You see, how could he get mercy? He'd earned it. He can't earn mercy. He can't earn mercy. How could he deserve mercy? The other man got mercy. A story told about Napoleon. Napoleon was a hard man. He was a hard <clears throat> uh, leader. He was tough on his men. He was tough on everybody. And there was a young man uh, that twice stole from his palace. And so he was condemned to die. And this young man had a mother. Mothers are very important people in our lives, aren't they? Uh, mothers tend to run the world sometimes. But this mother wasn't, couldn't accept that her son was going to die. So she sought an audience with Napoleon and got the audience with Napoleon. Right? <clears throat> and she asked him for mercy for her son. Napoleon's answer was, this boy has stolen from my palace twice now. He deserves justice, and that justice is death. The mother replied, but I don't ask for justice, your highness. I seek mercy. He does not deserve mercy, replied Napoleon. The mother passionately begged, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. Touched by the mother's grief and passion, Napoleon consented and released the boy. The first thing we need to understand about mercy is we don't deserve it. It's mercy. It's freely given. It's unmerited. If I go in the place where I'm asking God for what I deserve, there's no mercy. Because you can't have mercy if you deserve it. It's something that's freely given. The second thing I want to say to you is this. Be in the will of God. Right? Now, Jonah uh, says this. In Jonah, in Jonah 2, verse 8, he says, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, you know the story of Jonah. Jonah was sent to go to Nineveh. Uh, he decided, I don't want to go there. Those people are mean. Uh, they could hurt me. And besides, I'd like them to be dead. And God is, just <clears throat> God is just crazy enough to show mercy and spare them. And I don't want to be any part of that. So what Jonah did was Jonah took off in the other direction going to Tarshish. Now, <clears throat> what Jonah found was he found a place where there was no mercy. Well, almost no mercy. We'll talk about it in a second, but where there was some mercy in the situation. But almost no mercy. He, here's what happened. In Jonah's life, the mercy train was going to Nineveh. And there was mercy flowing rich and free in Nineveh. But Jonah got off the train along the way and went to another place. And you know what happened? He went to a place where there was no mercy. He went to a place where there was a storm that wouldn't quit. He went to a place where men took him as a last option and cast him into the sea. And he thought he would die. But you know what? He couldn't even die. He, <clears throat> he was swallowed by a great fish. And he didn't even die in the great fish. You know why it took him three days and three nights? To get right with God? Because he, he was thinking, it'll be over any minute now. But he couldn't even die. And you know what? <clears throat> Finally, he gave in to God. And he was vomited up on the beach. Now... Let me say this about mercy for Jonah. Jonah was doing the wrong thing in the wrong place, not where God wanted him to be. The great fish was mercy. Here's the way the story would have run if there was no mercy. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh. He didn't go to Nineveh. He went to Tarshish. God created a great storm. Great fish came along when he was thrown overboard, swallowed him, and Jonah died, and that was the end of the story. That would have been the end of the story. But you know what? God said, no, I'm going to use this guy. I'm going to work him through this. And it's going to be tough. But I'm going to bring him through it. Now, Jonah did not feel when he was in the belly of the fish like there was any mercy for him. He did, that, that didn't strike his mercy bone. 
That didn't, that didn't make him feel like things were going well, like, the, like this was a happy day. Jonah felt there was no mercy. God didn't care. Nobody cared. And he just wanted to die. And you know what? When you step off the mercy train and go to a place where God doesn't want you, you're going to feel like that too. You're going to feel like this is a bad place to be. You're going to feel like, where is God? And doesn't God care? And now God always cares. You're his child. He never stops caring for you. But you're going to feel like there's no mercy here. Now, it's not that there's no mercy. The mercy's flowing rich and fee, free when in the will of God. You see, <clears throat> Nineveh was full of mercy. Nineveh, listen, if, if Jonah, when Jonah finally went to Nineveh, the Ninevites didn't lay a hand on him. You know what happened? They respected him. The king, from the king down, everybody repented and they turned away the wrath of God. There was mercy there for him. But you know what? There's, we don't feel like there's any mercy when we're doing our own thing, doing a solo flight, going our own way. See, there's, there's mercy there for you, but the mercy flows in the will of God. Get in the will of God and stay in the will of God. Yeah. What does he want you to do? Do it. Are you out of the will of God right now? Are you feeling the, the lack of mercy in your life? Get back in the will of God. Get back in the place where God would have you to be. And enjoy that mercy. You know, <clears throat> They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Are you observing lying vanities tonight, going your own way, doing foolish stuff? Listen, get back in the will of God and enjoy his mercy. Number three, fear him. Psalm 103 verse 11 says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. The Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? Uh, which means that, you know, that when we fear God, that's the beginning of wisdom. Now, it's not this petrified fear that you see people have of pagan gods. But it's this recognition. He is in charge. He rules in everything in my life. If he puts his hand against my face, I won't be able to move. And if he puts his hand to my back, there's no one that can stop me. I want to live with one eye on heaven. Lord, are you pleased? That's living in the fear of the Lord. Because I know he controls all of it. That's wisdom. How foolish we are when we think we can do our own thing and we don't have to actually obey this God. He's in charge. He can do anything he wants to do. There's Jonah, <clears throat> uh, you know, in the middle of the sea, and a, a great fish swallows him. God's in charge of everything. How do you, how do you think, by the way, the, the, swish, the fish just happened to be there at the right time? You know, what that, what that was a very carefully coordinated plan, wasn't it? God had planned it that the fish would be right there. He knew when Jonah was going to get thrown overboard. And listen, he put the whole thing together. Do you think that God's not putting things together in your life? Do you think that God's not able to bless in your life? And do you think he's not able to withhold blessing in your life? Oh, listen, understand. We serve a great and a mighty God. He is able to, to let mercy flow rich and free in your life. He's, he's able to have you wake up in the morning and with tears in your eyes. Lord, I don't, I don't deserve all the blessing. And he's able to withhold the blessing so that you're smart. Amen. And he does it all because he loves you. Yes. Amen. Right? Final point is this, right? <clears throat> Show mercy. Matthew 5, verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You know, <clears throat> listen, I want all the mercy I could possibly get in my life, don't you? Yeah. I need it. <laughs> I'm enough of a knucklehead that, you know, I need mercy in my life and I need it regularly. But you know what? I need to show mercy. And here's what we tend to do sometimes. We tend to look, well, I'm going to have my relationship with God. I'm going to, and, I'm, and I'm going to be right with God and walk with God. But you know what? The horizontal relationships, the people relationships, they'll have to just fend for themselves. I don't have time for them. Uh, they, they annoy me. We have a saying in our we say, that wrecks my head. It's a very descriptive saying, all right? And people can wreck your head. And what we can do is we can have no mercy for people. And you know what God says? God says, hey, I'm, I'm looking at the way you're treating other people. You want mercy from me, but you don't show any mercy in your life. You want mercy from me, but you want to be the judge and jury in your own life. People bother you and irritate you and annoy you, and you get all bent out of shape, and you want judgment and justice, but you want mercy from me? You know, it's not going to happen. There needs to be mercy in your life. Now, let me backtrack with some questions here, right? <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> are you known for your mercy? 
Are you known for your mercy? And you say, well, no, that's not my gifting. I'm not, I'm not merciful. That's not my gifting. Well, I understand that, but you know what the passage says? The, the verse says there, <clears throat> if you want mercy, you've got to show mercy. It doesn't talk about a gifting. It talks about you showing mercy. It talks about you not being the judge and jury and executioner in people's lives. It talks about, you know, when people bother you and come short and so on, you know, that you show mercy to them. Secondly, are you more inclined to mercy or wrath? And you say, well, that's just the way I am. I, you know, I just get irritated with things. Well, maybe you should change. Maybe you should change. You want the mercy of God in your life? Maybe you should change. Maybe you should let the Spirit of God have his way in our, in, in our lives. You know, <clears throat> it's easy for us to get caught up uh, in, in a place where, you know, we're known for our wrath. What do your kids think of you, by the way? Awesome. You're a dad. You need to, you need to discipline your kids. That's absolutely essential in your life. But you know what? Do they know a dad of wrath? Or do they know a dad of mercy? Do you know what? You can deal with your kids and you can deal with them in mercy. You know, you can deal with them in love. and that, You know what? It's the same pain, but you know what? It feels a whole lot different when it comes from somebody who understands and who loves them and who they know. They know it. Uh, are you known for wrath or for mercy? Number three, does mercy sweeten you? It has a sweetening effect in our lives. You know, I, I tend to be very understanding of my own fault. Yeah, I know why I get it wrong and why I do wrong things and so on. I understand. I, I understand me. You know, but when it comes to other people's faults and flaws, we're oftentimes not nearly as understanding, are we? Now, you know what? <clears throat> we need to let mercy sweeten us. There needs to be mercy there, sweetening us. Oh, listen, God gives you mercy rich and free. There needs to be mercy in your life. And then, do you show mercy freely? Mercy freely, not earned. You know, <clears throat> there are people in your life that listen you got relationships and they work for you and you're happy to uh, spend time with them and give to them because these relationships work for you. What about those people that really don't? Those people that don't add anything to your life. Those people that maybe draw on your life. Do you have mercy for them? And then does your mercy overflow? You see, <clears throat> here's where we're going with all this. Here's the reality of it. You know, if, if, if I'm drawing mercy from God and it's overflowing to me, it's very easy for me to overflow. It's very easy for me to flow to others. But when I won't overflow, when I kind of want, want it for me, but I don't want to give it out, you know what? I end up not having it. I end up not overflowing. I end up, I end up being, you might say, tight as far as mercy is concerned. Now, <clears throat> I want all the mercy I can get. I need it, and so do you. Let's first of all reckon on the wonders of a merciful God and the way he reaches out to us and the way he shows mercy on us. Let's be in the place where we can receive that mercy and let's show it to others. Christian life is the best life, bar none, that anybody in this world can live. You were made for it and everybody out there was made for it too. But you know what? <clears throat> We are the advertisement for Christ to our world today. We have to let mercy be a reality in our own lives, and we have to show it.